Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Amy Castley, and we have a panel on contracts and commercial dealings and, and problems therewith. Um, so I am mainly going to uh, keep time. We're going to start with um, Michael Pinchoff, who's an attorney in the working in the Chicago area. And Michael, you want to take it over? I passed out a handout with some uh, case quotes that kind of flow with the, my presentation. Did everybody did I have enough copies? Paper instead of uh, PowerPoint. I'm, I'm uh, a paper guy instead of PowerPoint. I could hear the desperation and despair in John's voice. They froze my bank accounts. My wife can't even go to the grocery store. Law students, this is the kind of call you're going to get. <laughs> I've known John, a Romanian immigrant, for over 35 years. Through hard work and a diligent lifestyle, he and his wife, Lydia, had accumulated enough money to purchase a couple of apartment buildings that he managed and maintains and provides them with their primary source of income. After reviewing the pleadings, I determined that a privately owned community bank that had held the mortgage on one of his buildings had accelerated the mortgage note and confessed judgment on it. Yes, confession of judgment is legal in commercial transactions in my home state of Illinois. I don't know about here. Maybe you've studied it. So they proceed, they confess judgment on the note. Not a foreclosure, a lengthy foreclosure uh, proceeding, but a simple routine confession of judgment action without demand. They obtained an ex parte judgment, froze his bank accounts, which were conveniently situated at the bank. The event of default alleged in the complaint was not a monetary default, but rather was based solely entirely on the bank's insecurity. Certain that no court could possibly uphold this, I plunged into the factual, and legal, the factual investigation and legal research. And I flashed back to what my own negotiable instruments professor had taught me in law school. The bankers wrote the UCC, the bank always wins. John was current on his mortgage, had never missed a payment. But in recent months, negative cash flow had been depleting, uh, by virtue of negative cash flow in the building, he had been depleting his own personal account to make the mortgage payment. His loan officer had approached him out of the blue several months earlier, suggesting that he might be able to reduce John's interest payments. Reminds me of President Reagan's saying, those of you who are too young remember President Reagan, you don't, you don't, you never want to have the government ask you, uh, the government, I'm, the, I'm from the government, I'm here to help you. Um, I can't believe I'm quoting Ronald Reagan. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the bank approached him and said, we can lower your payments. So John turned over his personal tax returns, his rent rolls, his expense statements, and authorized an appraisal of the property. Well, John's building uh, typified the tanking rental market in Chicago and nationwide. Several tenants had been evicted, several tenants were cr chronically delinquent, uh, and by virtue of the foreclosures and the distressed sales in the area, property values had plunged way down. This balance sheet deterioration was occurring in the context of the commercial mortgage lending industry that's facing drastic regulatory pressures. As you probably know, dozens of banks, 100 I think or more last year, are shut down by the feds each year. And those who make the cut find themselves under tremendous regulatory pressure to bring in more conservative appraisals, reduce the number of troubled properties in their portfolio, increase their liquidity, maintain adequate capital reserves. In fact, in this case, my investigation revealed that shortly before the bank confessed judgment upon my client, the bank had entered into an agreement with the Chicago branch of the Federal Reserve uh, and the Illinois Department of uh, Financial Regulation. Pursuant to the terms of that agreement, the lender was prohibited from renewing or restructuring any credit to any borrower who was on its, quote, problem loan list. This list had been created, we learned, as a result of a prior audit. The bank couldn't lend any money, extend any credit to any uh, uh, borrower that was on this list unless they could demonstrate that they were, quote, adequately secured. With the stroke of a pen, my client's fate and the fate, of, the fate of countless other borrowers that had been placed on this list had been sealed. The bank's gratuitous offer to reduce John's payments was nothing more than a Trojan horse designed for the sole purpose of assuring the survival of the bank. 
Now, traditionally, judicial limitation on a lender's uh, discretion and potentially abusive conduct in declaring an insecurity default has been the duty of good faith defined in original section, UCC section 1-209, I'm sorry, 1-201-19, and specifically applied to insecurity default under original section 1-208, which is now 1-309. For decades, courts have grappled with two seemingly contradictive, contradicting approaches interpreting good faith, subjective versus objective. One of the quotes that I gave you in my handout is a court's attempt to struggle with these uh, approaches. In 2001, the Commission on Uniform Laws answered the call, or tried to answer the call, of courts crying out for legislative clarification uh, by adopting a hybrid definition of good faith uh, that it was intended to apply universally to all articles of the UCC except Article 5. The revised definition of Article uh, of Good Faith expands the scope from the narrow honesty in fact standard uh, to include the observance of commercial standards of fair dealing. However, the problem is legislatures have not unanimously adopted this revised uh, version of the UCC. Uh, I checked Professor Rowley's website. Is he here by any chance? Somebody tell him I gave him a free plug. <laughs> uh, if you check his website, um, he reports that as of July of 01, only 29 of the 41 states that have codified revised Article 1 have used this uh, uh, expanded bifurcated standard. Uh, and we have 11 other states that apply the pre-revised definition. So what we essentially have is a legislative hodgepodge, a non-uniform standard, uh, which is uh, really antithetical to the uniform commercial code. For uh, over two decades, courts attempting to apply this kind of amorphous UCC standard have expressed concern over the potential for arbitrary abuse and unfair advantage. Uh, the Montana Supreme Court observes that the subjective test, which is defined uh, in the quote I gave you, would, quote, allow a creditor to be unreasonable and place the debtor in an unjust position, since the creditor might at any time call the entire debt and require the debtor to prove the non-existent state of mind of the creditor. Thus, the code would permit a creditor to destroy a viable contractual relationship without requiring him to justify his actions. This dictum, in my opinion, I contend, illustrates the inherent flaws with the UCC approach of good faith. UC, under Section 1309, the burden of proof is on the borrower to prove that the lender's bad faith uh, uh, was, in fact, not merely a pretext, an after-the-fact pretext, to justify its own self-serving motives. In practicality, as in my case, this onus, this burden of proof, becomes even inherently more inequitable when we consider that at the time the borrower is uh, required to essentially prove a negative, what's not in the state of mind of the lender. Its borrowing power and ability to finance litigation has effectively been cut off by the bank that's at control of the faucet. Some courts have started to, to abandon the UCC definition altogether, instead relying on the common law implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing. This covenant was founded on Section 205 of the Second Restatement, recognizes the duty of good faith in the performance and enforcement of every contract, not just those governed by the UCC, and has been adopted in virtually every state. The drafters of the Second Restatement, I better not offend anybody if anybody was on that committee, did not attempt to define good faith, but instead uh, stated in a comment that good faith, quote, emphasizes faithfulness to an agreed common purpose and, consistent and, and consistency with the justified expectations of the parties. Uh, I want to move on to a recent case that kind of forms the, the basis of my article. I don't want to run long because of our rest of our panel. but. Um, my research, as I got into the research, disclosed a fairly recent case, 2012 case, out of Missouri of all places, kind of a red state, I guess. And in that case, the appellate court imposes an arguably unprecedented degree of scrutiny on a lender's conduct in determining whether or not the declaration of an insecurity default was, in fact, in bad faith. The court in the case of uh, uh, Frontenac Bank versus Hughes uh, applies a more pragmatic approach based upon concepts such as opportunism and exploitation. 
opportunism and exploitation. In that case, the Frontenac case, the borrowers argued that the lender breached its implied duty of good faith and fair dealing based upon its declaration of insecurity when, as in my case with my client, uh, the borrowers were current on their payments. Uh, the lender countered uh, that the bar one of the borrowers was insolvent, that the value of the collateral had deteriorated, thereby generating a whole climate of insecurity which justified the declaration of a default. Again, even though the borrower is current on his payments. The court in that case finds genuine issues of, of fact, denies the bank's motion for summary judgment, uh, and in fact holds that, quote, despite evidence on the record of defendants' financial struggles, the bank was under the good faith obligation to avoid exploiting the changing economic conditions to make gains in excess of those reasonably expected at the time of contracting. Again, incorporating that reasonable expectation uh, standard. The court finds that this duty of good faith imposes upon lenders the obligation to uh, prevent opportunistic behavior that has the effect of exploiting changing economic conditions for basically uh, windfall gains that were not reasonably expected at the time of entering into the loan. Well, to go on with my war story, when I read the case, I contacted the attorney down in St. Louis. Nobody's ever accused me of being shot. One, I was curious as to what, whether the bank was going to appeal this decision or ask for leave to appeal. In Missouri, they call it a uh, motion to transfer. Uh, my, my, uh, the attorney down there who was, had represented the successful debtor was very pessimistic at the time. And he said, basically, Mike, we have a very conservative Supreme Court down here, very pro-banking industry. There is no way that they're going to uphold this case. Further, he said, the Supreme Court in Missouri has taken the unprecedented approach of inviting amicus briefs mm -hmm. from the Missouri Bankers Association, from the largest banks in St. Louis, to comment on this decision. In short, he said, the banking industry down here is up in arms. Well, I was at that moment uh, uh, obviously concerned that the banking lobby would uh, again uh, uh, prevent justice from being done. Obviously very concerned that the thesis for my law review article would be shot down the tubes. But fortunately, a few weeks later, he called me and he said, Mike, Supreme Court denied the motion for transfer. So what we have is this case. What we have here is a situation where changing economic conditions have altered the balance between the competing economic interests between lenders and borrowers. The variable in the balance is that in this recessionary economy where, the le where lender insecurity is palpable, the arbitrary and unchecked use of these insecurity clauses can potentially lead to abuse, exploitation, opportunistic behavior, which can result in windfall gains for lenders and disastrous outcomes for borrowers, and I would submit an adverse impact on the economy as a whole. Without clearly defined, uniform, and consistently enforced standards, the playing field is going to tilt in favor of lenders. By striking a fair and equitable balance, commercial lenders may be less likely to engage in legalized tyranny, referenced in one of my quotes, uh, and I think this ties in with, with Jeremy's uh, talk, uh, another description of what Jeremy will refer to as world B contracts. Legalized tyranny <laughs> is one court's way of describing a situation where one party, in this case the bank, has essentially unfettered, unrestricted discretion, in this case to declare a default. Traditional means that the courts have used, the UCC standards in my opinion are inflexible, vague, difficult to comply with, to, to apply with any consistency. I don't know, I can't tell you whether this Frontenac decision, it has not been cited. I checked it on the airplane <laughs> as I was leaving yesterday, shepherdized it like a good law student. No case has cited it yet. I don't know whether it's good law. For those law professors uh, in the group, maybe it'll at least make a good hypothetical. I don't know. Uh, we'll see. Uh, it sure did, in the words of Elvis, have the Missouri banking industry all shook up. Well. Before I close today, you all may be wondering what, what the situation was with John. How did it end up? Well, I'd like to tell you, at the end of a good war story, <laughs> that I filed a motion to vacate the judgment, vacated the judgment, and obtained a multi-million dollar award of <laughs> compensatory and punitive damages, but I can't. <laughs> we sat down with the uh, 
banks board of directors, the loan officer. This is the reality of practicing law for you law students. Um, as a lawyer, I had to make a decision of whether or not I was going to invest potentially dozens if not hundreds of uncollectible hours fighting for a principal. One lawyer once told me, went to a seminar, keep a picture of your wife and your children on your desk so when you're tempted to handle something for free, take a look at your wife and your children before you agree to handle a case. Well, I took a long look. Well, what ended up happening? My client ended up having to basically turn the keys to the property over to the bank, uh, executed a deed, transferring title to the property, and liquidated he and his and his wife's entire uh, retirement account, which is about $50,000 in order to vacate the judgment, turn their lights on, and to buy groceries. The icing on the cake, a few months later I learned that the bank had turned around and in a pre-arranged deal had resold the property to an investor for an additional five, I'm sorry, $50,000 profit. Well, I guess my law school professor was right. In the real world, the bank always wins. Thank you. Jeremy Tillman, Professor Tillman. Thank you. So it's good to see so many students here today. I should say, since you're here, that I am the editor of the Contracts Prof blog the official blog of the AALS section on contracts. <laughs> I hope you're impressed. Uh, and it, it's a good resource. It's look it up. Uh, if, you're, if you're still taking contracts or commercial, we have, we have uh, lots of resources there that you might find interesting. So a couple of the panelists at the plenary session mentioned that they were intimidated talking in the presence of Linda Roosh, but then it turned out like they've spent 20 years working on law reform. So if they were intimidated, imagine how I feel <laughs> talking about the battle of the forms to this crowd. Um, so my strategy here is to do a very long intro and run out of time before I get to my thesis. <laughs> and I've, I've enlisted Amy as my co-conspirator. She's going to cut me off just when I start to speak about substance. Um, this project is part of a, uh, a larger appreciation of some recent scholarship. And to my relief, I don't think any of the people I'm talking about are here today, although they, well, at least one is at this conference. So this paper is an attempt at uh, CUNYan normal science in a quantum context. The work is normal science because I'm working within a paradigm established by Peggy Radin, Nancy Kim, Oren Bargill, uh, and some others who have identified the fundamental problem of mass market consumer contracts. According to that, got a sound track. Uh, according to that uh, uh, paradigm, different kinds of contracts today operate according to very different terms because they exist in different quantum states. There are, in reality, quite a few different quantum states. Uh, if one considers the theme of last year's AALS section on contracts meeting about the laws of contracts, uh, but I'm focusing on Pe Peggy Radin's distinction to borrow her nomenclature between the world A, world A contracts that we mostly use to teach contracts law in the first year and world B standard form contracts, a world that encom encompasses most consumer contracts uh, and in which, uh, and plays a much lesser role in first year contracts courses. World A contracts are based on agreement between or among parties, but mutual agreement uh, plays no meaningful part in World B. The absence of consent in World B results, according to Radin, in normative degradation. That is, without consent, such purported contracts no longer further the fundamental values of autonomy and freedom of contract that underpin the modern legal ideology that informs both contract law and democratic theory. Now, I should add, right at the outset, three caveats. First, the worlds are not really quantum worlds. As Radin and Kim recognize, there's a continuum raising, uh, ranging from agreements no negotiated between or among parties that have relatively even bargaining power through standard form agreements subject to some revision 
through standard form, form agreements that are not subject to revision but contain only reasonable terms. And then into the spectrum that ranges from oppressive boilerplate agreements such as Nancy Kim's crook provisions and what she calls sadistic contracts to Peggy Radin's mass market boilerplate rights deletion schemes and Teresa Amato's online asbestos. So this paper offers strategies and doctrinal fixes that relate only to the contracts on the far end of the spectrum, those that are clearly part of world B. Second caveat, I do recognize that the common law, which operates pretty well with respect to world A, can also address some especially toxic world B contracts. World B contracts, for example, can still be struck down for being unconscionable. That is cold comfort, however, in large part because of what Ra Peggy Radin calls democratic degradation as opposed to normative degradation. So democratic de uh, degradation is about the numerous legal mechanisms in world B transactions such as form selection clauses, arbitration clauses, class action waivers, disclaimers of consequential damages, et cetera that prevent transactions from being subject to effective legal challenges. Such pr provisions have interor in interorum effects that discourage their proper the proper enforcement of legal rights, even where the provisions are, in fact, unenforceable. Right? You're just consumers don't know that they can sue when they've signed away their rights to sue. So these characteristics of World B contracts deg degrade democracy because they permit private actors to dictate contractual terms that undermine regulatory and remedial schemes that are the product of democratic processes. So for example, uh, the Supreme Court has recently allowed arbitration provisions, including class uh, action waivers, to, strump, to, to trump state legislation or, 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 or state um, I'm sorry, state legislation that prohibits such waivers with respect to claims arising, un arising under state law. In the recent Italian Colors case, the Supreme Court granted American Express its motion to compel arbitration of plaintiffs' antitrust claims despite the fact that plaintiffs would be unable to pursue their claims in arbitration on a class basis. The ins expense involved in bringing an antitrust claim effectively deprived plaintiffs of a meaningful remedy that they could not pursue their claims through a class action. As Justin Ka Justice Kagan summed it up in her dissent, if the arbitration clause is enforceable, Amex has insulated itself from antitrust liability, even if it has in fact violated the law. The monopolist gets to use its monopoly power to insist on a contract, effectively depriving its victims of all legal recourse. And here, in a nutshell, here is the nutshell version of today's opinion admirably flaunted rather than camouflaged, too darn bad. Uh, as the final paper of this section will, uh, this paper, sorry, as the final section of this paper will suggest, scholars working within the new paradigm have suggested multiple ways out, and I'll add my own recommendations to the list. One solution turns on the battle of the forms and the other is an extra legal strategy. My extra legal strategy relates to my third caveat, um, which is that I have my doubts about whether it's really possible for our democracy to get any more degraded than it really is, than it already is. So I maintain that precisely the factors that have degraded the law of contracts have also degraded our democracy. That is the same powerful moneyed interests that create mass market boilerplate rights deletion schemes, capture legislatures to prevent the passage of legislation that would thwart such themes or worse still, create legal environments in which such schemes can develop and prosper. In any case, I regard the notion that we have some sort of representative democracy in which our elected representatives in Congress draft and enact laws responsive to the needs of the electorate, which the executive branch enforces in accordance with interpretations provided by the judi judiciary as a fantasy devised in middle school civics classes quite divorced, quite divorced from political realities. So if you believe in that, have I got a tooth fairy for you. As a result, the tools in our arsenal for combating de democratic degradation in World B cannot be limited to the common law tools that operate on a level playing field. 
they must be tools designed for asymmetrical war warfare. Um, so let me just introduce my thesis. <laughs> with trepidation. So contracts doctrine has a mechanism for dealing with agreements that arise without mutual consent. It is the battle of the forms. The UCC's battle of the forms protected consumers in some situations if a court was willing to assume that they had made an offer to purchase and then received a form order acknowledgement from a seller. The seller's additional terms would not become part of the contract unless they corresponded to gap fillers provided in 2207 through. So that was the approach of the Kansas District Court in Klocek v. Gateway. There the court treated Gateway's terms and conditions, which Klocek did not discover until after the computer was delivered, as additional and different terms which were not part of the party's agreement. But the UCC's battle of the forms no longer can protect consumers operating in world B. That's because merchants, or the attorneys who devise their methods of entering into bargains with consumers, understand the battle of the forms and consumers do not. <coughs> Merchants thus now routinely require consumers to agree, usually by clicking a button on the browser, to the merchant's terms before they complete the transaction. Just Judge Easterbrook's view that there is no battle of the forms when there is only one form in play, though wrong, I think, according to comment one to 2207, is widely accepted. So my doctrinal fix starts with Llewellyn's premise Carl Llewellyn long ago noted that buyers often give blanket assent to a contract without agreeing to specific terms. He thereby split contracts for the sale of goods into a conceptual center and periphery. The center is the basic exchange that each party has in mind at the time of contracting. Uh, in a consumer contract, the buyer wants stuff and the merchant wants money. That's the transaction. A consumer may well shop around to get the best possible product at the cheapest possible price. She may give some consideration to warranties, but she's not thinking about peripheral terms such as choice of law, arbitration clauses, limitations on, on damages, class action waivers, etc. Llewellyn was fine with blanket assent so long as the peripheral terms were not unreasonable. Nancy Kim goes a step further than Llewellyn in the design contracts so as to enable consumers to give their specific consent to peripheral terms. I would go farther still. The consumer should be bound to core terms but cannot be bound to peripheral terms without knowing consent. And while Llewellyn did not go that far, this, this result I think is consistent with other provisions within Article 2 such as its approach to disclaimers of warranties. The UCC recognizes that warranties rest on dickered aspects of the individual bargain and go to the essence of the bargain. So I, in essence, propose a special version of the battle of the forms for consumer transactions. Um, the, com the, the consumer is bound to all salient terms and to any additional non-salient terms to which the buyer has expressly agreed. And it's quite easy to design a web page where instead of just clicking I agree once, there's a bunch of boxes and you individually increase, uh, uh, agree to each term, term. So that's my doctrinal fix. Do I have a few more minutes? Yeah. So then the asymmetrical war, war felt fair part. Uh, and this picks up on some ideas in the sort of back end of Peggy Radin's book, Boilerplate. Um, basically, it's a strategy called constructive shaming that was pioneered by an animal rights activist named Henry Spira. Over a couple of decades, beginning in the 1970s, Spira launched, launched successful campaigns and got institutions as diverse as the New York Museum of Natural History, Amnesty International, Revlon, and McDonald's to reform their policies relating to the treatment of animals. Uh, and Spira, this was sort of you know 20th century technology, so his, he would just take out full page ad ads in, in major newspapers, but he wouldn't even do that most of the time he would just send mock-ups of the ads uh, to these uh, entities. And because he had a reputation for being a reasonable negotiator, that would force them to the table. And in almost every case, the exception is Purdue chickens. <laughs> um, he got basically what he wanted. He reformed practices by going after the, the industry leader, forcing them into reasonable negotiations rather than being constructively shamed. 
and the result was real reform. Um, so as Oren Bargill notes, consumers have been seduced by contracts. Corporations like Apple and Google and Facebook prosper based on the goodwill of consumers who love their product. Constructive shaming could be ef especially effective in this context, great, um, since one can engage in constructive shaming using the very social media that are the product. One can, for example, use social media to encourage, encourage mass opt-outs of targeted industry leaders. One can use Facebook to encourage people to use comparable platforms that have less oppressive privacy policies. One can use wikis and shareware to create alternative platforms that are free from oppressive boilerplate terms and which do not pass personal information onto third parties in a way that would make even the National Security Administration blush. But of course, Google and, and, and Facebook and Twitter, they all do this and it doesn't capture headlines uh, on, in the New York Times or elsewhere. So in short, the Occupy movement, remember them? Vaguely. <laughs> They had a great strategy for the 20th century. Um, it, was, it was equally well suited for the 18th century or the 19th century. But I think a 20th century uh, social movement needs to occupy Facebook and Twitter and to supplant the human megaphone with the infinitely more powerful electronic megaphone. Thank you. Professor Sidney DeLong is next, please. One of the last remnants of the citadel that uh, Professor Prosser noted was crumbling uh, in the 1960s, the citadel of uh, the privity rule, which protected manufacturers of products from claims by consumers for harm, um, is the fact that in many states today, uh, a person who brings a claim for breach of the implied warranty of merchantability uh, cannot uh, sue the merchant who sold the goods unless that person is in privity of contract with the merchant. Um, those of you who've looked at the history of products liability may have noted that that particular um, uh, defense was crumbling during the uh, 1960s. Uh, McPherson versus Buick and other, court, other cases uh, were, looked as if they were poised to say that it was no longer going to be a defense. But then when um, products liability was generally accepted, my theory is that the pressure to change uh, the privity rule went away. The assailants uh, who won on products liability sort of left the battle and left this uh, remnant of the citadel of, pri of privity. Um, and uh, it operates uh, in a very uh, arbitrary sort of way. Uh, consider um, two uh, buyers. Let's say Alpha wants to put a new roof on her house, so she goes to Gable Stable and she buys some shingles at Gable Stable. Then she hires a contractor to put those shingles on her house and construct a roof and some other improvements. The shingles, however, are defective. They leak and water damages uh, other property in the house and Alpha is put to the expense of having to uh, repair and replace not only the shingles but the other property. Now, if it has not been disclaimed, Alpha has a good claim against Gable Stable for breach of the implied warranty of merchantability. Now, consider Beta. Beta wants a new roof on his house. He hires a contractor uh, on a cost plus basis. Contractor says, I'm going to be using Gable Stable shingles. Alpha, Beta says, fine. Contractor buys the same shingles from Gable Stable, puts them on Beta's house. Uh, they too fail. Beta suffers identical harm. Uh, does, Gable, does Beta have a claim against Gable Stable? No. Beta is not in privity of contract with Gable Stable, only with contractor. Contractor is in privity with Gable Stable, but contractor did not suffer the damage to the roof. And so you have a rather arbitrary distinction between Alpha and Beta. They've each purchased, un, uh, they've each come into possession of unmerchantable shingles and have suffered identical damage, and yet one of them has a claim for breach of the implied warranty, and one of them doesn't. Now, scholars and courts for a long time have bemoaned the arbitrariness of, this of the privity rule. 
The privity rule seems to frustrate the basic policies behind the implied warranty of merchantability. Now, the implied warranty of merchantability, even though it sounds as if it's a, a part of contract, is actually has nothing to do with the party's agreement. It has nothing to do with consent. It has nothing to do with awareness. It is a form of product regulation by the state. The state says that if a merchant sells a product that it deals in, then that product must be fit for its ordinary purposes unless the merchant gives signals that it's not by expressly disclaiming the warranty. And so the policy behind this warranty, uh, you've probably studied in contracts class, is that it's generally thought that the merchant is in the best position to detect, control, uh, spread, and bear the risk that its products might be nonconforming. So it's uh, economically efficient for the merchant to bear this cost. Um, now there have, so the basic model I'm going to be looking at uh, today is uh, that you have a merchant who, without disclaiming the warranty, sells goods to a reseller. Those goods are unmerchantable when the reseller receives them, but the defect is not discovered. The reseller then resells the goods to buyer. At that point, after the resale, the defect is discovered and it causes both direct and consequential loss to the buyer. The question is, what can we do to give the buyer a claim against merchant? Well, there are three primary dodges to the privity rule. The first is the use of third-party beneficiary law, the idea that somehow the remote buyer is the third-party beneficiary of the agreement made between the merchant and the reseller. Now, while that might or might not work for express warranties, which are, as you just heard, matters of agreement between the parties, uh, it can't possibly apply, at least in theory, to implied warranties. The implied warranty arises automatically. It is not an agreement made between the reseller and the merchant. Uh, and so it's piling fiction upon fiction to say that in that sale, the merchant intended for a buyer to have enforcement rights on an implied warranty that it was giving to the reseller. A second uh, dodge to the privity rule is the concept of agency. Agency uh, would mean that uh, the reseller was the agent either of the merchant in the sale to the buyer or the reseller was the merchant's, uh, the buyer's agent in the purchase from the reseller. Uh, either way, you close up the buyer and the merchant into a privity relationship. Now, most resellers are not agents of merchants. Uh, parties have been pretty unsuccessful in arguing, for example, that distributors are agents of remote sellers. But every now and then, a reseller might be an agent of a buyer. For example, Beta might, instead of having a cost plus contract, might have authorized contractor to purchase shingles from a merchant, uh, or from Gable Stable, uh, in order for use on the house, so that Beta it himself would have been the purchaser through the medium of his agent contractor. In that case, you've got privity of contract, and Beta would have full enforcement rights. Uh, a third uh, uh, dodge around the privity rule is the one I'm going to talk about today, and that is assignment. Uh, the idea is that a reseller would assign its rights against merchant to buyer at the time reseller resells the goods to buyer. And buyer would acquire the, the necessary right of recovery as the result of this assignment. Now, an assignment is the trans it's, it's loosely said to be the transfer of a right. Uh, technically, it is said to be the extinction of the right in the assignor and the creation of an almost identical right in the assignee. So that after the assignment, reseller would have no more claims against merchant. All of reseller's claims against merchant would have been assigned to buyer, and buyer would sue merchant on the uh, warranty as a result of the assignment. So that leads us uh, to the question then of, uh, now, and, and it, it's important to recognize that an assignment puts the assignee uh, in, the literal, in the shoes of the assignor. The buyer will have exactly the rights the assignor had, no more and no less. If the warranty were disclaimed in the original purchase, then the assignee would take the warranty subject to the disclaimer, uh, similarly with, with arbitration clauses and the like. So what, what does it mean to assign a warranty? Well, if the assignment takes place while the original contract is still executory, um, then we have no particular problem. In other words, if a if, um, uh, contractor makes a contract with merchant to buy the shingles, and before delivery assigns that contract to buyer, now buyer steps into the shoes of the contractor, 
and has all the rights of performance. Buyer can enforce all warranties in that respect, and it's really not, not uh, problematic. Um, secondly, there can be an assignment of a shows in action, a, an assignment of a claim for relief that arises after the first contract has been breached. Now, let's say that uh, a party has a contract with the assignor, breaches the contract, and then the assignor assigns its claim for breach to the assignee. Now this raises a, a topic that until about the 20th century was highly problematic for legal theorists, the idea of assignment of a claim. Um, really, they used to write law review articles about assign assignments of shows in action and whether or not those could happen. And I want you to care about that this morning. <laughs> I want to try to make you see that it's important. Um, it used to be thought that, you, that, for example, in a case of a tort, let's say someone commits a tort and you are harmed, and you want to assign your claim against the tortfeasor to, to another person. It was thought that you could not do that because the relationship between the plaintiff and the defendant was personal, and you could not substitute another person into that relationship. It would be like um, I go out and I, I play poker one night, and I come back and I, I, I see my wife and I say, Gene, I've got some bad news for you. Uh, we were playing Hold'em, you know, no limit, and uh, I thought I had the nuts. You know, I thought I really had a good hand, and the other guy went all in, and uh, well, make a long story short, I lost you in this poker game. Uh, I, I, I basically lost uh, my rights as husband. So, so now, now you, you, you're, you've, he's, he's got all the rights I would have had in our relationship. Well, you would say that, that, that that's not an assignable relationship. You can't assign a, a, a relationship like that. But to the, to the old common lawyer, it was almost as incredible that you could assign a tort relationship. And that, so, so if you want to try to t understand what they were thinking. So you have this, prob this, this idea that now uh, under Section I think it's 2-1-210, uh, uh, under the UCC, all rights are assignable, uh, either executory contract rights or remedy rights. They say you can assign the rights to breach of the entire agreement without, without uh, saying very much more about it. So the UCC is very open and friendly to the concept of assigning uh, remedy rights. But now we come to the problem that we're looking at here. Let's say that the uh, seller, uh, merchant, delivers goods to the reseller. The goods are non-conforming upon delivery. Now, the, the duty of a seller under Article 2 is to deliver conforming goods. It either performs or it fails to perform at that moment. After the moment of delivery of goods, there are no more warranty rights that the buyer has. What the buyer has is either nothing because the warranty was performed or a claim for relief for breach of warranty that it may not know about yet if the warranty was breached. But the seller has no further duties unless the warranty expressly extends to future conduct. So what does reseller assign to buyer? Reseller assigns to buyer a claim for relief that it's not sure it has in the first place, and secondly, that hasn't yet caused consequential harm. The buyer is looking to recover for consequential harm that it will suffer as a result of the nonconformity. So I, I don't think there's any other analog in law uh, where you have a, a, an assignment of an unripe tort claim, an unripe claim for relief in which the, the wrongful act has occurred, the harm hasn't occurred, the harm has not occurred to this, the reseller, the harm is going to occur to the buyer. And so the real question uh, that, that led me to this paper is, can you do that? In other words, uh, if the reseller here, uh, our contractor, purports to reassign to the buyer Will it really be assigning to the buyer a right to recover for the buyer's future consequential loss that results from this nonconformity, or can the buyer only recover for such losses as the seller has incurred up, up to that point? And that's why the title of the paper is Not Exactly. Um, now, I, at this point, c confront the problem that I, t I told one of my friends at law school who I was talking about, and he he's not interested in the assignment of shows as an action either. Uh, but he said, you know, isn't it just a policy question? And I said, damn it, you're right. Um, uh, yes, uh, conceptually, it's very difficult to say why the buyer in this circumstance ought to be able to recover for consequential loss caused by a breach of warranty when the breach of warranty occurred to someone else and they didn't suffer the consequential loss. But as a policy matter, positive law can do anything it wants to. So we could say that, a, that an assignee in that circumstance should be able to recover for foreseeable uh, consequential loss that occurs from breach of the warranty. Uh, we, have a, we have an analogous situation in the way the code deals with horizontal privity under Section 2-318. 
Uh, someone goes to the store and buys goods. The goods are non-conforming. Boom, the warranty has been breached. They come home. They serve the goods to a guest in their home. Their guest serves con uh, suffers consequential loss. They have no trouble suing uh, the seller of the goods because uh, the code has just decided to ignore the lack of privity in that circumstance, even though the warranty was breached before they suffered the harm. So there is no, there is no, um, how much time do I have? Three. Okay. Um, there is no harm, uh, I, I think, in simply dictating that buyers should be able to recover in these circumstances. Now, uh, the reason that, that led me to this question was my concern that uh, buyers of new homes quite often have made unsuccessful claims for defective products that have been used in the manufacture of their homes. For reasons I can't go into right now, they can't make products liability claims. Uh, briefly, simply because the home is not a product and because oftentimes they're seeking economic loss instead of non-economic loss. So their only hope really is to sue for breach of warranty, but they they're confronted with the privity problem. Uh, and so the question was, why not get contractors to assign to buyers of new homes um, their implied warranty rights against the major suppliers from whom they have purchased the components in the home. That is, why not make those rights part of the purchase of the home? You already get uh, 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 warranty rights on appliances, for example, that are, in the, uh, that are in a new home. And so the question here is, why not do that? Uh, a secondary question is, if someone sells goods, should they be deemed or presumed also to assign such warranty rights as they may have in connection with those goods as an incident or an implied incident of the sale. Most courts have said no. A sale of goods does not imply that you're also selling the, the retained rights you may have against your, your seller. Um, and the question then is, why would a seller be reluctant to assign its warranty rights to a buyer? Why would a reseller be reluctant to assign its warranty rights to a buyer as part of uh, a resale. Um, and here um, we get into a little bit of, of speculation. Um, what good are they going to do, the reseller, to, to retain these, this theoretical claim I have against the merchant? Um, uh, those of you, like Steve, are experts in Article 9 may say, well, maybe, th maybe the reseller has already pledged its uh, commercial tort claims, you know, to, to, a, to a third party. So the reseller may not be able to, to convey an interest in commercial tort claims that it has. Uh, if you conceive this warranty claim as a, as a commercial tort claim. Um, the assignment itself should not uh, specifically uh, prejudice the merchant. There is only one state in the union, I think, that says that, that uh, contracts for sale are not, uh, that warranties are not assignable uh, uh, in contracts uh, for sale under Article 2. I think it's Georgia says that it, that it prejudices the merchant uh, in or, uh, to have its, uh, its warranty obligations assigned to a, to a stranger. So that is really the, the, the point of my, um, of my piece and, and, and to say that for those of you who are representing buyers uh, in these circumstances, it's something to think about. Um, uh, an application to donees occurred in Seattle several years ago. They discovered that they had been given a Matisse that had been stolen uh, and they had to give it back to the heirs of the, of the original owner who, uh, for, who was robbed uh, in France. Um, and then they sue, well, they couldn't want to sue their donor because they didn't have any claim against their donor. So they decided their donor had purchased it from a New York art gallery. And the New York art gallery had breached its implied warranty of title when they sold the goods uh, to the donor. So they sued the New York art gallery, which raised what defense? Privity of contract. We didn't deal with you. We dealt with the, um, the donor. And the art museum got around this by obtaining an assignment from the heirs of the donor of the uh, implied warranty rights against the art gallery and was able then, in theory, to enforce their claim against the art gallery. So it's, a, it's really a point of planning that I'm, I'm offering, that you should think about taking an assignment of warranty rights when you represent a buyer of goods, uh, not just uh, an assignment of the title.
unselected file in the U.S. Um, I'd like to thank everyone here to, to coming uh, today to my, for my presentation. Um, I'm very honored to be here. Um, very honored to be here amongst um, some members of our plenary session this morning, Professor uh, Stepanak and Professors Cohen, very well-known names in the commercial law field. And thank you also to the students for coming, especially on a Friday. Um, my presentation deals with um, some recent issues that have occurred in the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy proceedings, uh, namely derivatives and bankruptcy. Um, Basically speaking, um, I'm going to talk about the Bankruptcy Code a little bit and the policies underlying the Bankruptcy Code, Chapter 11 of the Bankruptcy Code, and um, the, the lack of clarity uh, that, there, that exists for derivative trading contracts and bankruptcy, certain provisions of derivative trading contracts. And it's important because there are basically over trillions of dollars of derivatives traded on a daily basis. And right now in the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy case, even though the, the, the case is on its way to completion, there is still hundreds of millions of dollars of disputes going on uh, with respect to closed out derivative trading contracts. Um, first, I'll start with the Bankruptcy Code. Uh, the basic policy of the Bankruptcy Code, especially Chapter 11 of the Bankruptcy Code, is to maximize the value of the debtor's assets and to give the, the basically the company that files for bankruptcy a breathing spell to reorganize its affairs and most importantly, preserve jobs. Um, now, in, in, in this process, it's very important that um, the bankruptcy code is predictable so the, the, the Chapter 11 debtor and the parties that deal with the Chapter 11 debtor or, or company who may become a Chapter 11 debtor can predict their rights vis-a-vis -vis one another under various contracts they have. The flip side is also very important for banks that deal with um, various um, companies, that lend to various companies and have various financial transactions with various companies to be able to conduct a credit analysis. And part of that credit analysis is what happens when my counterparty files for Chapter 11? What can I do? Can I take my collateral? Do I have to pay my, my counterparty? If there's open obligations to them, what do I have to do? What can I do? Um, and, and part of the underlying policy of the Bankruptcy Code is you, they don't, the, the, the Code in, in Congress does not want parties to be able to pick apart the debtor, parties to, to pick apart the debtor on the eve of a bankruptcy filing, because then no company could reorganize. There's certain things the Bankruptcy Code puts in, um, certain provisions of the Bankruptcy Code that are very important. One of them is Section 362. It's called the automatic stay. When a company files for bankruptcy, certain things, there's basically an automatic stay, a stay that basically freezes, if you will, um, the rights of the creditors of the debtor um, to collect on certain debts, to enforce certain judgments, and to terminate um, contractual agreements with the debtor. Another important provision is Section 365 of the Bankruptcy Code, it was what's, what's called executory contracts. These are contracts that have obligations on both sides of the contract at the time of the bankruptcy filing, such that if one party breached, it would be a material breach. An example is this. I own a pizza shop, a pizza company. I make pizzas in my pizzeria in New York. I have a five-year supply agreement with somebody who supplies me cheese. I file for bankruptcy during year two of my supply contract. That's an executory contract, because if I was to breach or my counterparty was to breach, we have three years left on the contract. Well, almost every contract has a provision in it saying, if, my, if the counterparty files for bankruptcy, I don't have to, ob I, my obligations under this contract are null and void. That's called an ipso facto clause. And generally speaking, those clauses, as a matter of public policy, are not, in, are not enforceable under Section 365 of the Bankruptcy Code. Why? Because nobody would continue to supply a Chapter 11 debtor in a chap in, under such circumstances, and no company in bankruptcy could ever reorganize if all the suppliers cut off their supplies. So um, basically, Section 365 of the Bankruptcy Code says any of these types of provisions um, uh, in a contract that modify or terminate a contract solely because of a bankruptcy filing or the financial condition of a debtor are not enforceable. 
Similarly, Section 541 of the Bankruptcy Code invalidates any contractual provisions that basically affect a forfeiture of property rights uh, based upon a Chapter 11 filing. A contract right is a property right, right? Um, also important for this, this discussion is what, uh, the Section 553 of the Bankruptcy Code. It allows what's called set off of debts that are mutual. Um, so if I, owe a, if I owe somebody money, say $100, and they owe me $50, um, we can set off their rights um, under the set off provision of Section 553 of the Bankruptcy Code, and I only owe them $50. In a way, it makes me a secured creditor to the effect of my right of set off. And generally, Section 553 allows this. Um, what's problematic with Section 553 is what's called triangular set-off, and that's kind of important for our discussion uh, today. Um, generally speaking, parties to derivatives contracts are very large financial institutions, big banks, the JP Morgans, the Morgan Stanleys, giant hedge funds. And generally speaking, there's, the, there's a parent company like um, Lehman Brothers Holdings, Inc., who is the parent company with various subsidiaries, hundreds of subsidiaries. And they may have to have these subsidiaries for various regulatory purposes. Um, and they may have the, the subsidiary company that conducts the derivatives trading um, uh, operations. In Lehman Brothers' case, it was Lehman Brothers Special Finance. And often gener these derivatives trading contracts have a clause in the contract that says, well, if the parent company owes me money and I owe money to the subsidiary, I can just set those off. Well, under the bankruptcy code, to set off debts, they have to be mutual. And there's an issue as to whether you can create mutuality by contract. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that um, and the lack of clarity there. Um, so that's the basic um, background of the bankruptcy code. Derivative contracts um, are, are um, basically, as one of my co-panelists said to me this morning, you're talking about gambling. And essentially it is kind of gambling. It's a way for financial institutions, hedge funds, and all these other players in these markets to basically hedge their bets. Um, the most basic derivatives, the ones that are the easier ones out there to, to kind of to understand are, are uh, currency swaps. Uh, for example, if I'm a U.S. bank and I'm loaning money to a European borrower, I may also engage in a currency swap to hedge against fluctuations in dollars versus euros. I may enter that swap with my borrower, or I may enter it into that swap with another financial institution. I may like the financial institution because they may have better credit standing, better credit rating. Um, another type of uh, common derivative that's very commonly entered into, again, in, co in, in connection with most commercial loans, are interest rate swaps. Uh, many commercial loans are made in a floating rate interest rate, uh, like LIBOR, um, to, to hedge against um, major fluctuations in interest rates, a bank may enter into an interest rate swap agreement, again, with its borrower or another bank. And um, generally speaking, these, these, um, th these um, swap agreements or derivative contracts are entered into what's called a notional amount. So on a, on a loan agreement of a million dollars, we'll use a simple number, um, a bank may do an interest rate swap with another bank based on a million dollars. They never exchange that, out, that million dollars, they just change the percentages of, of that notional amount. So that notional amount's never really um, exchanged. Um, and through the financial system, banks may take pieces of these derivative contracts and actually swap them off or hedge them off with other banks or other hedge funds, other players in the financial world. Um, almost all derivative contracts are documented under one agreement. It's called the ISDA Master Agreement. It's a contract, if you will, or an agreement that was uh, drafted by the International Swaps and Derivatives Association, which in turn, not surprisingly, is made up of the largest banks and financial institutions in the world, the JP Morgans, Lehman when it was existed, et cetera, Goldman Sachs. And it consists of 830 members in about 57 countries. And basically the way the is the master agreement works is this. There's one major document, one contract. There's a schedule to the contract that, that various amendments and credit um, type provisions are put in the contract. And then there's a confirmation that um, is entered into for each trade. 
So if we have one interest rate swap between two parties, that's one confirmation. A currency swap between two parties, another confirmation. So you could have thousands of confirmations documenting thousands of trades under one agreement. And the, but the, the, the efficacy of the agreement, if you will, or why it's supposed to be efficient, is if one of, my, one of the parties defaults, and bankruptcy filing is obviously an event of default, we can collapse all of these trades into one net number, and one party owes the other party um, um, what the net amount is, whoever owes the money. Um, and that's basically the idea behind the is the master agreement. So it's a single agreement, this netting principle, um, and there's this, this, this issue of netting. Now, there's payment netting versus closeout netting. Payment netting is this. Under these derivative contracts, generally speaking, they're long-term agreements. They're either five-year swaps or 10-year swaps or something like that. And generally, every, there's reset dates that occur every month or every quarter. So every month or every quarter, the parties communicate and they figure out who owes who money and they pay that amount. Now, if one party files, one party, if one party defaults by filing for bankruptcy or, or another event of default occurs, then closeout netting occurs. And what that is is a pr special provision in the agreement that sets damages for breach of the contract. But that closeout amount takes, it, it, it takes into account the future of the swap. So if it's a five or ten year swap, that closeout amount is generally going to be a big, big number, a much larger number, if you will, than compared to the number that's owed on a reset date. So it's like a discounted cash flow analysis type of, um, type of um, uh, valuation proceeding. Two of the, pr the provisions in the derivatives trading contracts in the ISDA master agreement that are very problematic are, is the payment suspension uh, walkaway clause and the triangular set-off clause I mentioned earlier. Um, the bankruptcy code contains what's called certain safe harbors that peel back, if you will, some of these provisions on executory contracts in Section 365. For example, in a general supply agreement, if my counterparty files for bankruptcy, I can't terminate the supply contract, like the cheese example. I have to still give him cheese while he's in bankruptcy and operating his pizza shop. He has to pay me, but I still have to supply him. Well, for derivatives, the underlying um, idea, if you will, that was basically as a result of lobbying by banks, um, banks said, well, derivatives are different. Because we're interconnected in the system, if my counterparty files for bankruptcy, I can't wait around and continue to have this open swap or derivatives trading contract with them because I have a back-to-back -back trade with some other bank. And if I don't get paid from that, from my counterparty, I can't pay my other counterparty visa all the, all the way down the line in the financial system, we could have a domino effect of bankruptcy filings. So Congress enacted what's called these safe harbors that basically allow a party to a derivative trading contract to immediately terminate, accelerate, and set off um, any amounts that are owed to a counterparty that files for bankruptcy, that defaults for, uh, by filing for bankruptcy, and to immediately seize any collateral that's held, if there is any collateral held. Um, and some academics have criticized um, uh, the, the safe harbors over the years, saying that they give special preference to derivative trading contracts, and they do, and those are some very good arguments out there. However, even though we've had substantial sweeping financial reforms through the Dodd-Frank Act, we still have the safe harbors. They're still there, and they're still a little bit ambiguous. Um, Section 560 of the Bankruptcy Code says, you know, a party can exercise any contractual right to cause the liquidation, termination, or acceleration of one or more um, derivative trading contract swap agreements are basically defined as the same thing. Um, and that, again, partially overrides Section 365 of the Bankruptcy Code that says you can't do this with any other type of contract. Well, several, re several recent matters of first impression recently arose in the, in the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy proceedings uh, from 2009, and some of these matters are still being litigated. Um, that, that kind of show that these, these safe harbors really aren't that clear. Um, and obviously this adversely affects the ability of large financial institutions to conduct credit analyses with respect to these transactions. Also affects the ability of a Chapter 11 debtor to propose a plan because if it has to spend time litigating over all this stuff, it's not spending time formulating plan, a Chapter 11 plan. Um, okay. Um, so um, one of the cases that came out uh, recently was um, this Medivante case that said, well, um, and it was with a payment suspension clause under the ISDA master agreement. The ISDA master agreement says, well, if, you, if, if, if a counterparty or its guarantor files for bankruptcy, um, 
you can withhold payment. And um, then Avante said, well, Section 560 of the Bankruptcy Code allows a party to terminate an executory contract, but it doesn't allow someone to, to withhold payment. Um, and that's okay. Um, that's, that's pretty straightforward. But what Medivante really didn't clarify is what if I terminate and withhold payment not based on my counterparty's bankruptcy filing, but their parent guarantor's bankruptcy filing. And they kind of glossed over the issue. Another case in the Lehman Brothers New York um, uh, bankruptcy proceeding said, okay, well, we'll deem the parent and the subsidiary the same, and you can't do it. The same issue reached the UK courts and uh, uh, um, and. Uh, uh, and another Lehman proceeding that was trending in the UK courts, and they reached the opposite conclusion. And of course, um, the New York case um, was a bankruptcy decision settled before appeal. Uh, Medivante went up on appeal, and a bunch of other similar, uh, similarly situated cases went up on appeal, and they all settled. So you really don't have a lot of case law precedent there. Also, similarly, this issue of triangular setoff um, was recently litigated. Again, um, the bankruptcy court said, well, this is not mutuality. You can't create mutuality by contract. Um, and again, um, it, was a, it was just a bankruptcy court decision, again, settled before um, any appeals till the Second Circuit could have been uh, litigated. So my, um, you know, my, but the proposal I made in my paper is that these issues should be clarified by statute. I don't think walkaway clauses should be enforceable under any circumstances because they deprive a Chapter 11 debtor of the payment rights and really its ability to reorganize. Triangular set off um, maybe should be, maybe if you have mutual guarantees going back and forth between the parties, maybe in that limited circumstance should be enforceable. But again, there's split in case law on that too. So I think the bankruptcy code should be amended. And also Title II of the Dodd-Frank Act, which was recently in enacted um, as, a, as an alternative um, insolvency regime for financial institutions should also be amended to clarify these issues. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. We have, uh, we have about 10 minutes or a little bit more for um, thoughts, comments, questions. Um, and the video people have asked that we uh, pass the mic around for those, or I guess that I repeat the questions. That's what I'll do. So, any uh, thoughts or comments? Okay, so um, whoa, uh, so I'm 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 envisioning click-through screens where you have to where each consumer has to specifically assent to each additional term, and um, one of the things that I put in the paper, and this is building on uh, I think Nancy Kim's arguments. Um, I actually think it's something that Sid said at uh, the AALS section this year. Um, that so there, there are these people. There, there are some sc contract scholars who've argued basically these terms are products, and uh, and basically consumers are by giving blanket assent saying we like the products, right? And supposedly they're getting a discount, right? You're buying things cheaper because there are ARP clauses and class action waivers. But the problem is, and I think this was your point, that we don't we don't we don't know what we're how to value those things, right? Um, that's the difficulty, right? So if you're somebody who believes in this contract as product theory, then you should also believe that the, the sellers know what the value of those components are. And they can say $3 off if you click, you know, if you click uh, uh, arbitration clause, $3 off if you class action waiver clause, right? And that's the way I would design these so that you have real con knowing consent to each of these clauses. Thank you. 
I'd like to follow up on that. So it, does the seller have to sell it if the uh, consumer doesn't click one of these boxes? Because unless you're going to compel that, then all you've really done is change clicking one box to clicking multiple boxes, in none of which the consumer is going to read anyway. So I, I wonder if there's an, a slightly different solution. You talked also about uh, constructive shaming. Why not turn it around instead of shame and, and have sort of a, a good housekeeping seal of approval? So why not, why, why not have the ABA and the AALS or whatever come up with a set of standardized fair terms and authorize retailers to use our mark? You've got these fair terms provided they go along with that. Wouldn't that be a, a better solution to this problem? Um, so that, that solution is already out there. I didn't talk about it because it wouldn't be anything original. Um, and, you know, it's a good solution. I don't know if it's a better solution, right? I mean, uh, the fact that it's, ha it's been out there for a while, I mean, I think Ian Ayers has been writing about this for like 10 years now. Um, and it, it, it doesn't seem to have had, you know, the, it, has, it doesn't seem to be embra have been embraced. So and I'm certainly, I'd like, to see, I'd like to see workable versions of that, right? Um, now, as to the thing that your, your, your comment that consumers won't read it anyway, right? I mean, I, my theory is that there's th is the challenge is to try to make it salient to consumers, and the way to make it salient to consumers is to say $3 off if you choose this option, right? Because price is salient, right? And then I think they would read it because they'd see every – they'll be like, you know, your, your – uh, what do they call it? Your, your checkout cart. Right, and it will show how much you're paying, and it'll change every time you check or don't check. Just an idea. My question is going to be the product of coming in late because I didn't hear your talk. So speaking from complete ignorance, but it sounds like you're just offering to pay consumers more money if they'll check boxes that they don't know what they mean except that if I check this, uh, I get a discount. Is that right? I mean, who's, who, who's going to rationally read the box if they know that by, by not reading by checking, they get a little bit of money? So I also, I also have something different to say, but, but, but it's on a, on a different topic. So, okay. yeah, go ahead. I think the fair response is to refuse to answer because you came in late. But, <laughs> but <laughs> I said I think the fair response is to choose not to answer because you came in late. But, 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 but uh, you know, I think, I think you're right. That's a weakness. Um, you know, I think my solution – so I would think that my, my solution, which I'm not even sure it's that original, um, will actually couple with, with Stephen's solution that there are a wise websites – that would have lots of information. What are you agreeing to when you click these boxes? And it would also be a mechanism for consumer education. But now I think, uh, hopefully you'll ask someone else a question. <laughs> just, just a small comment for Sid. Sid, do you know the, the engagement rate case in California, yeah, which, which uh, the, pardon? Well, yeah, this, uh, this this was a uh, uh, that uh, the buy the buy the man claim was was fraudulently sold, uh, and the the ex wife got in a property division. She sued the seller. He then assigned to her the right of action, but she was a third party beneficiary because she went to the store with him to pick out the ring. Yes, uh, you're right. Yeah, that's the name, shower. Yes. Seller assigns fraud rights to, to the downstream buyer, then um, A, can the downstream buyer re recover damages for the fraud that haven't yet occurred? B, and this is really uh, mind blowing if you're a Hofeldian, 
can you assign a power of avoidance? In other words, if the victim of the fraud has not a right necessarily to damages, but has only a power to undo the transaction, I'll break it. Is that a thing that you should be able to assign, and what would that mean? So, yeah. But I think the shower was not an implied warranty. It was an express warranty. Pardon? It may or may not have been fraud, because they certainly backed up their assessment with a subsequent thing. But I think it was, you're right, it was third-party beneficiary. And there, you could find the necessary intent in a way that I don't think you can if the initial transaction merely had an implied warranty of merchantability. I had a question for Michael, and I'm going to go ahead and ask it. You talked about the sort of suspicion list that your client was on. And how was that generated? Where was the initiative to create such a thing? The initiative, we learned that there is an audit of this particular lender. And my client's account was one of the ones on this list, a watch list, because the appraisal showed that the property value had plummeted. Actually, it was operating under a negative cash flow. Remember, this is an apartment building. And so he was actually, as I said in my talk, taking money out of his own pocket to pay the mortgage because the building was operating at a negative cash flow. So it was on a list of these small community banks who are undercapitalized. And it's a stark contrast to what Peter was talking about, how the huge banks, first they're bailed out. Now they have this favorable provision, this safe harbor provision. Yet every week you seem to hear about another local community bank being shut down. And I think you've had quite a few down here in Florida. I know we've had a lot in the Chicago area over the last two or three years because of these very strict. So it's the local banks that are being audited, the community banks, that are really the ones limited to the community, to businesses, and trying to do what banks should be doing, in my view, as opposed to gambling, which is what Peter was talking about the big banks are doing. They're the ones that are getting the intense regulatory pressure that are put on those lists, that are forced to enter into this agreement as a condition to them not being shut down. So it was a result of a number of the information that, as I indicated, was essentially solicited from my client under the false pretense that we were going to rewrite your loan, refinance your loan, and reduce your payments. They were just getting all the documents to support their right or ability to take this underperforming loan, quote, unquote, off the books, even though it was current. And no advance notice. Right. Your clients could presumably sell the building for the $50,000. Correct. Anything else? Actually, we have a lot more. Okay. Michael, that's fine. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
financing arrangements with the bankrupt so that that would warrant this special right? like a basic secured creditor who perfects my security interest under Article 9 of the UCC, and my counterparty files for bankruptcy. I, I'm, I'm stayed for a bit, exactly. I can't just go in and grab my collateral. Now, I can try to lift the automatic stay. However, if the bankrupt, the Chapter 11 debtor, provides me adequate protection or adequate protection payments, I can't just go grab my collateral. So they have an opportunity, if you will, to use the collateral, especially if the collateral is necessary for an effective reorganization to reorganize their business. So there, there is more protection, if you will, for the debtor in that situation. Um, what, whereas with the derivatives contracts, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty. Is there anything to justify that distinction? The, 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 the systemic risk, exactly. Pre prevention of systemic risk or a domino effect in the financial industry is the purported um, um, uh, reason. Again, probably as a result of lobbyists, uh, bank lobbyists, the big bank lobbying, and and and, and, um, and it's interesting if you, if you look at the history of the, of the um, of the safe harbors. They were gradually expanded over time, and in 2005, they were they were greatly expanded when they uh, revised the bankruptcy code. Um, right before they trash the economy. Yeah, yeah. Trash the economy. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we are due at lunch at 12:15.